we're standing at the top of the, uh, and this is the Peach Hoogie, Selween, Hoogie Wetlands. Hoogie Wetlands, Peach Selween. But the idea is we're taking some of the flows from the very lower end of Peach Creek and putting it into the floodplain, and then it'll be uh, passed through a series of constructed channels down to the next watercourse, Selween Creek. That's right. And the whole idea, there's a whole bunch of species of fish and wildlife that use these areas along the margins of the Vetter River for their life cycle. And one of the species in particular, coho salmon, this is called critical habitat, particularly in the winter time. And I think you know that. Um, when we've talked about it, uh, coho salmon will live here for their entire freshwater life cycle, but it's in the winter. The reason it's called critical, uh, if, a, if a juvenile coho tries to winter in the Vetter River, it's probably going to survive at a less than 10%. So one in one in 10 juveniles that are alive in September will make it till May. Whereas if a juvenile can find its way into this off-channel habitat, seven out of 10 will make it till May That's to massive. go to the ocean. That's a big change. Yep. So a little bit of off-channel can actually make any river much more productive uh, for coho salmon particularly. So in the Vedder River, coho can live along the margin of the Vedder. Chilliwack River all the way up into the U.S. above Ch Chilliwack Lake in the summer, not a problem. Temperatures are warm, uh, food supply is high, they're growing quickly, but as soon as temperatures drop and food supply drops, they have to have a way to protect themselves from flooding and not to burn calories that they can't recover in the winter. And that's what Off Channel does. It gives them a place to, to get through the winter in a safe and secure place. And I guess that's also why we're doing all the planting, is to help with the leaf litter and the drops and the insect rain right. and, and the cover cooling. So in the late 70s, when they were trying to figure out the Chilliwack River coho population, because they had just uh, were uh, designing the Chilliwack River hatchery, for instance, they did some tagging of juvenile coho in Chilliwack Lake, which I think is about 40 kilometers upstream. And what they, they tagged them during the summertime. Now, it's likely those coho may have spawned in what's called Dolly Varden Creek or the Upper Chilliwack, as far as the U.S. into the North Cascades National Park, mm -hmm. spawned there, moved to the lake for the summer. But interestingly enough, they were recapturing fish that were captured in the summer as little guys in Chilliwack Lake in tributaries exactly like this one, peach, cell weed. And the ecology from the literature is, if you're living in the lake, which is stable, why would you move down here? For one reason, that's almost at 2,000 feet. This is warm rich, high nutrient, and on a March day like today, it's starting to wake up. Mm -hmm. So if you want to grow fast before you go to the ocean, you don't want to be up in the mountain streams necessarily, some do, yeah. but a significant portion come to the lower river and look for these, what you and I might call ditches or wetlands or ponds. They really are the backbone of uh, that early growth period, let's say from about February through May before the smokes go to sea. Right, and that's kind of a critical period you know, whether they're going to Do. survive. So the larger the smolt, a coho smolt, the literature says, when they go to sea, the better they survive marine transition. And Natasha, as what you were describing, the plantings just add to the insect population. So these juveniles, as soon as the days get a little bit longer and the temperatures rise, all those leaves from last fall are, are tucked in all these little slow pockets in the pond that was created over here. And now they're being break, broken down by bacteria, and those bacteria are being grazed by various insects. So those insects, again, are the prey for coho salmon. The other point I, I thought would be worth making, because a, a, a number of individuals are, are contributing uh, funds from uh, Steelhead Derby, right. uh, Rainbow Trout, the sa same thing. Their prime habitat is main stem habitat, but always a portion of the population will move into the off-channel, just like coho salmon not as critical habitat, but still important. So every time that you look in these off-channel, you get uh, the dominant catch is typically coho salmon. But I understand your crew this morning uh, just pulled some traps, and again, they're finding rainbow, which rainbow and this river are likely steelhead. And we're also seeing cutthroat trout and the coarser fish as well. Right. So it's, it's about the, the whole aquatic ecosystems we're really seeing. Right, and we mentioned the species. There's one species, Salus sucker. I think most of us that grew up in a certain era didn't view suckers as important, but now in Canada they're highly important because these are 
turned out to be quite rare. They're called Salus suckers. They're unique to our part of the world mm -hmm. and uh, under various international conventions it's our duty not to see them disappear. That's so right. these habitats are actually prime Salus sucker habitat too, as you're well aware. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess it's really important to, to note that our projects, while they focus on salmon first, that they're always building outwards and looking at biodiversity. What does Salus suckers contribute to the ecosystem? And I think, how can I describe it? Um, there's something beautiful about a functioning ecosystem. Uh, many of the species we knowingly use, and I'll g give example of the salmon species, they're iconic, we, we enjoy angling them, we enjoy catching them, we enjoy eating them, we enjoy watching them, but they're only a, a little star in the constellation within a watershed. Sailor suckers, what role do they play? The, the, what they play is um, the difference between a field full of uh, maybe dandelions that we might find use for, or a field with many different shapes and sizes. So Salus suckers, uh, we don't use them commercially, but they, in the ecosystem, they feed on insects. They, they presumably change the populations of insects a little bit. They, they uh, turn over rocks for their spawning. They contribute to the ecosystem. They feed other species that eat fish, uh, not not ourselves, but other species. And I guess. In, uh, we've learned from, uh, from the past that when we focus on a single species today that we think is useful, we, uh, it's a dangerous thing not to look at the ecosystem that supports them. And Salus sucker supports the salmon ecosystem of the Veda River yeah. in ways that we do not fully understand. So uh, this aspect of the project was constructed in the summer of 2018 and uh, the work began, I think it was like September 4th, right when most of the trail users and the kids were back to school, in we came. And what you see behind me is a creek with water. What we started with was a forest. And we had excavators come in, the biology and the technical team, uh, before the excavators to essentially flag out a small path that would transform this forest floor into a stream. And it took, I believe, about two months to actually construct the channel and it involved excavators digging down, getting into this water lens, connecting to the upper flows where we saw the Hoogie wetlands and the Peach Creek, placing all the boulders along the channel, placing the large wood crisscrossed up top to create those um, predator aversions and we actually brought in some spawning gravels in this particular section of the channel as well. Uh, so construction alone the, the, with the heavy machinery and the surveyors was about two months and then after that we wait for the fall rains to come and that's when we're with our volunteers hand digging in all of our native plant species because we want to recreate the floodplain and get that high volume, high density uh, uh, diversity and really support the canopy, regrow the forest floodplain. And uh, that takes a lot of effort, a lot of planning. So a project like this, we're basically planning about a year in advance, if not longer. And when we're doing this particular project, it was about five years in the making. And we knew that we had to first find the water find the resources. Um, I call it a cake or an onion, but we're doing all the overlays of values. We need to make sure that the channel is in line with the species at risk, like the Salish sucker. Um, we're avoiding things like Japanese knotweed because we don't want to accidentally spread something that isn't good for the, the forest or water for that matter. And making sure we're away from roads and dikes and infrastructure so it really is a large planning piece and then the rollout or the build out is the most fun of course uh, and this is what the result is and this is still new um, we call this who you wetlands or peach sawing connection channel but on the north side of the Veta river 
if we were to hop onto the south side of the Vetter River, Brown Creek Wetlands is uh, about five years, we'll call it older. And you can see what a few years of growing really does to an ecology in the landscape. So what you see today is, we'll call it in its infancy, it's gonna mature, it's going to grow up. And I encourage you to take a look at Brown Creek Wetlands. This is the salmon red. So when this was built, the gravel was largely sort of put in an even gradient, you know, a, a sort of a slope just after construction. But the way you can pick out a red is you visualize the fish will move the gravel with their tail. So they're digging upstream and they will dig the gravel and the current takes the smaller gravel downstream. So if you look at this patch of water, you'll notice it's deeper here, it gets shallower and faster and then it drops down. That pile, that where it's building up and going down is actually where the eggs are, that's the nest. And the way it was formed is the last place the fish died, or dug, excuse me, and she probably was running out of eggs, is right there. If you notice the size of the gravel is smaller here than there. Those are the size of the pebbles she couldn't move. If she had more eggs, she would have put her eggs in those larger stones and then moved upstream and dug another hole and it would have covered them. So just by looking at it, we call it the dune effect. There's a deep and then shallow deep that tells you fish have been actively spawning here. And if you think about it, gra gravity is doing the work of providing the oxygen to the eggs. That water is higher here than it is there. So it's pillowed up and gravity is pulling it down through the gravel, through the eggs. So that's, they're using the velocity of the water and then it lifts up from momentum and it's forcing its way to give oxygen to those eggs, which are probably about that far from the surface. And where they are is not by the smaller gravel, but they're beside the bigger stones that were left when she dug the hole originally. And that protects them in their own little bunker. This is an important uh, chum salmon uh, stream too. Chum salmon do like these off-channel areas because they're protected from floods. So those are the two main species, but as Natasha mentioned, rainbow trout come in here, which are primarily juvenile steelhead. Cutthroat trout, they may be uh, sea run that go to the Fraser River as adults, or they may be residents that live their whole life in this stream. And then you add the other, speci or other species that are rare and nationally important, as we described, the Salish suckers. Love these sort of areas in this particular uh, part of the uh, Vetter River watershed. There's two or three watersheds. Uh, Selweed is the main Salish sucker habitat, and this water connects to Selween Creek. So juvenile suckers can come up here and spend their summers and winters out of Selween, so it's giving them a little extra habitat to move around in. And I just want to say that the tendency for human development is to simplify floodplains for our purposes, as we're all aware, uh, just to uh, deal with flooding of residences and farms. But by that simplification, um, we're taking the options away for particularly fish species, but other species too, aquatic species, that they deal with uncertainty by having a diversity of habitats they use throughout the year. In other words, they move. They move in the winter to get away from the floods. In the summer, they go to the river to get water when maybe some of these areas are dry along the margins. So what we're trying to do in the floodway is just to put diversity back, uh, whereas Natasha said it's safe for our man-made structures like roads and homes and railways, but provide as much diversity as we can within the landscapes we're left with. And I think people have to know in the Vetter River, I think about in 1870, the main branches of the river were hard over down towards Sardis. Um, and uh, over those uh, many decades, the river has found its way to be put here on the vet, what was called Vetter Creek. So it's a very narrow corridor. I would argue probably at least 90% of it, the Vetter River floodplain is gone. We're living on it. So this is really the last 10%. And we're going to try to squeeze every bit of productivity we can out of it. And Natasha touched on it. It's been a decades-long effort, many partners, and all I can say is the Fraser Valley Watersheds Coalition is so happy to work with the partners of the day. And in particular, we're talking today about the support we're getting from the angling community. I think it's fantastic. Uh, this is the public good. It benefits us all, us all, and we're just so happy to be part of this great group of people that are trying to do what they can. I want to thank uh, everyone for coming out and showing interest in the habitat restoration projects undertaken by the Fraser Valley Watershed Coalition along the Vetter River. Uh, they've been uh, ongoing for a number of years, but I think we're particularly proud over the last two years to do the 
uh, Peach Creek Salween Wetland uh, Hoogie Pond Wetland Extension. And uh, if you want more information about this project, uh, Natasha. We would love to have you follow us on Facebook. You can connect with us through our website, which is www.fvwc.ca. And please join us. We uh, welcome all volunteers. Wally Hall and his son, uh, years ago, uh, spent a lot of time on the river. It was very important for that family, in particular Wally and his son. They really connected at that level. Unfortunately, with Wally's son, he passed away, and in memory of that, he wanted to do something. So because they were steelheaders, um, we turned our steelhead derby into the Wally Hall Memorial Derby.